So, welcome everyone. My presentation about how Cassandra 4 gave us to cut the cost, and we will be talking about the money. Everyone wants to save some money to have some, some pay rise or stuff like that, to not let Bezos left to the space one more time and do, uh, or for example, create next uh, weird movie. So, uh, my name is Robert Strupio. I'm the I was on the first Cassandra Sum in 2014, the first Cassandra cluster was also made like, like, like that, the first Cassandra production fail, and also success. And I'm Java developer, architect, DBA, DevOps, and finally also the FineOps. So who is the FineOps? The FineOps is the person who play to, with the Google Cloud, with the AWS, with Azure, to pay as less as possible. For, for example, looking for some leftovers, cutting costs on everything what is possible, analyze day by day cost explorer, advice, CUD, CUD, saving plans, some reserved. Or, or, and finally, FineOps should, should save more than just earn. But it's just a general rule, but sometimes it could, it could, be, it could be different. And FineOps also looking for the different weird correlation, like for example here. And yeah, sometimes it's okay that we are finding something. Sometimes it's oh, it's, it's like it's like here. Okay. So let's go further. So this presentation will be focused only on AWS because I have 25 minutes and uh, I have to do some uh, uh, some on on, on that. Uh, I know that everyone wants to go to the lunch to eat something, so I will be speed up and also only talk about the AWS. So it's enough, so I don't have enough, enough time to talk about the Azure or about the GCP, for the GCP fans. So, so Cassandra. So Cassandra could be also, could be deployed on on-prem, cloud, hybrid, every, everyone, everyone knows that. And we can also choose the DB database as a service like the Astra Keyspace or any, or, or, or any other, all just self-hosted on the bare metal virtual machine or containers. So we will be focused also on just on self-hosted Cassandra. So where is the cast on the Cassandra which is self-hosted? So may, mainly are it's in the, inside the compute, so CPUs and memory on the storage, it could be ephemeral, non-ephemeral, on the network, of course, and some other stuff. And of course, the DBA tools. So CPU and RAM, why it's so important to go into Cassandra 4 to save some cost of the CPU and memory. So Cassandra 4, of course, as everyone knows, supports Java 11. But why it's so important Java 11? So what is new in the Java 11? So, too long to read, just Graviton is Java 11 for, for being full speed. There is an article about that, there is a source on the, down of the, of, of, the, of the slides, that on the Java 8, the Graviton don't have the full speed. So, if we go, if we want to cut the cost, just use Graviton. So, it's ARM CPU made by uh, Amazon, and the third generation of, of Graviton contain the DDR5, the RAM memory. We don't have the issue of NUMA, so non-unified memory access, because it's just one socket. There is no Graviton 3 machine which, which contain more than one CPU, physical CPU. Also, if you want to go with Graviton, just go to the newest Ubuntu version. If we, for example, Okay, it's Apple or, or Bezos, I don't know who. Uh, so basically, if we go to the Graviton, we should, we should use also the Amazon Linux 2, that's the second edition, or Ubuntu 22 or Ubuntu 2023, something the new OS, because on the old legacy, also, for example, the cache are not visible. So if you want to have the full speed of Graviton, we should choose the Cassandra 4 because it's Java 11 plus the newest Linux. And finally, in our company in Mui, we are switching from old Intel machine to the newest Graviton. And finally, after that, we are realized that the Graviton 
third generation are so fast because it is the DDR5 that we can even cut the number of CPUs and, and memory by uh, divide by, by two. And there is the final result of the cost on the AWS cloud. I have to cut the numbers, but we, will see, but we see that we are switching for, for example, RD, R5D 20X large to, for example, R7G X large or, or so on. Okay, so storage. Where, do, when, where we can save some money on the storage size? So basically, on AWS, you have two possibilities. Go to with the ephemeral drive, so it's local SSD and VME. Or non-ephemeral is the EBS, so elastic block storage. If we go to the elastic block storage, of course, we have three different options. It could be the standard drive, so it's the magnetic drive. We could go to, with GP2 or GP3. Don't use GP, G, GP2. If someone has GP, GP2, on, uh, for example, for the root volume, or something else, let's move that to GP, GP3 because GP3 is less expensive, it's cheaper, and it's much faster. Or IO2 and IO, IO1 and IO2. So, for example, if we compare the same machine, one is R7 G2X large plus GP3 ephemeral drive, the cost to R7 G D, so which the drive, 2x large, so it contains the local SSD. The price is lower on the machine without the, FM, the, without the ephemeral drive. But of course, the ephemeral drive is much faster. So we have the ephemeral, but if we are choosing the faster ephemeral drive, which is a local SSD, we have also some additional cost, the cost of ephemeral risk. So if we stop the instance which contain the ephemeral drive, the ephemeral drive will be loose and we lose all the data which are, which are inside. So we cannot do any fancy feature like the AMI rollout. We cannot do, for example, the detach, detach and attach this drive to another EC2 machine. We cannot easily scale up and scale down EC2 machine. So we lose a lot of capabilities which we have when we are using EBS drive. And we cannot easily extend or replace our, our drive. For example, after, after making some weird stuff on our tables, for example, remove this, this one which are not used, we want to save some costs by making our disk drive smaller. But we cannot do that using ephemeral drive. We have to go with the EBS, for, for example. So what is new in the Cassandra 4? If we go to the Cassandra 4, there is another new fancy feature, which is the compression, the compression Z standard. If we have some table which contains a lot of data and it's, not, it's like sometimes rarely used, we have a lot of disk space used, but the CPUs are not so often, often in use, we can switch easy the compression from default LZ4 to Z standard. After that, we will cut the disk space like 25%. After cut the disk space 25%, we can switch the, the EBS drive also to the smaller one, and also save some cost. Of course, and we do exactly the same. We, we deleted and we dropped some tables which are not used. Uh, we realized after we realized that after some after some inv long investigation, and we also switch the compression algorithm from the default LZ4 to Z compression on the rarely used table, and after that we cut our EBS drive cost by two. So another another thing. So there is a, some, some parameters read ahead on the Linux side. So when we are reading some data from our EBS drive, we're reading something more and place that in our page cache. So the general recommendation, which was on the Cassandra Apache.org in, in the production recommendation page, said that if we are using SSD, we should go to the four kilo, kilobytes read, read ahead. But this is, this is the parameters which should be set for local, lo local SSD. If we go with GP2, with GP3 or IO2, these parameters will, when will be removed, when will be replaced from the default 
256 into four kilobytes make our cluster so stressed that it will be working two times worse. We test that very, very hard. So it's a general recommendation, but when we are using the bare metal machine with the local, local SSD drive, if we are using EBS drive, this general recommendation is not for us. Just remember about that. Yeah, it's not for us because the EBS drive are of course the network disk and the latency are much bigger and when we are, when we are read ahead something from the, our disk size and we are keep that in our OS page cache and we have very fast DDR5 memory, it has the benefits. Yeah. So network, when we can, where we pay for the network? Of course, it's the interzone which is free on the AWS. There is a traffic cross availability zone and of course cross the region. Service like S3 also could be, could be for free, but it also depends on our configuration. So for interzone, we are not paying anything. So for some cluster which are, which are not so critical and can even lose all the data, we can place that by topology only on one availability zone. But it's also it's very risky, and I not uh, it's not it's not the general recommendation to avoid any any other availability zone. But it's something which we could consider. But with, if we are thinking about the traffic, which is the inter region, we have the possibilities to enable compression. So first one is the traffic be between the node and the client. Of course, we should use for the very small pieces of data, the snappy algorithm, which is by default disabled, for example, in free Cassandra data, and the traffic between the nodes. So in Cassandra 4, there is the new feature, which is the non-blocking non -blocking internode connection. It also used the netty, not like previously, which was blocking. So we should compress all the data. If by default, of course, then com the, the I don't know why, but now it's working. So maybe I talk too much, uh, but uh, by default, of course, the traffic between the nodes in Cassandra, it's the compression between the nodes in Cassandra is enabled for data centers. But if we have different availability zones and uh, just Cassandra in one region, we are using more often the availability zone per rack so we pay for this traffic between the, between the racks. So my recommendation is to enable this compression between all the nodes. So between the different availability zone. Of course, we also did that. And after enable the clients to, to node compression and after enable to compression between the nodes, we also have some cutting cost after that. So, Basically, if we are sending some data into S3, like for example, the incremental backups, like for example, the backups or something else from our EC2 machine, we should not pay anything for that. But of course, we could have something which is called, sorry for that. Mm -hmm. We should, we could have something which called is the NAT gateway. So if we are running out of our VP VPC to something else like the S3 service, we could serve our, our the network traffic directly to EC2, to EC2 to, to, to directly to S3 or via NAT gateway. If we are not setting something what's called of gateway endpoints. If someone want to don't, if someone don't want to pay a lot of bucks for the using NAT gateway, there is free of charge gateway endpoints. And after that, we are not paying for connection to S3 for our EC, EC2. Uh, we see the result of enable this endpoint. So, clients anti-pattern. So, Cassandra 4, have some new app, have some new capabilities, which name is the virtual tables. And after that, we can easily track the service, which is the betas. 
for example, which use the different protocol version, which use uh, something, something weird, which make a lot of data transfer, which we should, which we want to, for example, avoid. And after that, if we are go into the virtual tables and analyze that, we can also remove some weird stuff. Yeah, I don't have time to talk about that. And finally, ach achieve some better lat lat latency. And for example, there is a miss of, miss of this slide, but uh, people are often use the Spring Data Cassandra. And inside the Spring Data Cassandra, it's some critical bug. And it's the critical bug in the GitHub 1213. I think that a lot of people know about that, but it was in the Spring Cassandra data for uh, 3.x. And it bugs create the prepare statement for every single queries. So if we, for example, are happy that we are using some fancy feature like Spring Cassandra data, everything is prepared, is made, every query made prepare statement, but it's not reuse, reuse that. It's not binding the new value, but for each particular query, create the new prepare statement. So we know that it made that stress on our on our prepare statement cache, and also generates additional traffic. So my yeah. and if we are go to the table which was introduced in Cassandra 3.11, not in 4.x, we saw that for example for each for each queries, we have the new prepare statement, which of course made a lot of latency issue, latency issue and of course also generated additional traffic, which also made the cost. So my, my general recommendation is to upgrade Spring Data Cassandra to the newest version to avoid that issue. And for example, if we are, if we have something which name is the Vault in, in the integration, and for each microservice we are generating the new creden credentials inside our Cassandra cluster, there is in 4.x very extremely important parameters. So we can set up our out create constancy level and out divide constancy level as ever we, we, we want. So basically by default in the Cassandra 2, 3, I think that even in the one, there is the constancy level for rich authentication, just one. So if we have situation like, like that, that we have some microservices deployed, for example, Kubernetes or something, something else, and we have this uh, vault which generate the new cred credentials, we could have the situation that one node goes down, what is normally in Cassandra, because there is some patch, there is some operation, because maybe someone uh, kill minus nine by some incidents or something, some, something else weird. So any other nodes, which was the coordinator during the creating the new credentials, have some, contain some hints. If the nodes will go back, it will be, se it will be sent back to these nodes, which are which are, which are down. And of course, if we are asking that node by our microservice to know if some users have the permission, have some credentials, the information about that could be stored in our hints and in the queue of the hints. And if we are asking that particular node which was down, we have some, we have some out, uh, permission uh, issues. And uh, to avoid that, we have to increase the authentication uh, read constancy level or to not use any weird service like Vault, which creates in every five minutes new, new accounts and propagate that to all the cluster. Okay, of course, if I want to convince people to go into Cassandra 4, there is also something that's its end of life for 3.x. So if you are looking for the support version during the download, the Cassandra, we just read that the end of life is around the December 2023. So now, if we have the version which is out of support, we should have, we could have some non-finance risk 
which also cost us uh, uh, money. For example, in the in the past there is some major bugs, major vulnerabilities like the uh, JMX RCE, so with remote code ex execution, which was, which was of, of course uh, solved by releasing new version. There is, for example, log for shell, another big major big major bug. Uh, for example, 2023 over overflow bug. If we are stay on the legacy version, which not provide the upgrades, we will have the issue that there is some vulnerabilities which is not fixed. So, summary to go to the launch. So, on the Cassandra 4, choose the Java 11, even if it's possible to use Java 8. And, of course, the newest, newest, newest OS. Of course, go to the Graviton. Always uh, test all good advice if it's match your cases. Because some advice could, could be, some, some not. For example, the Z standard. In our cases, on the 90% of tables Z, using Z standard, it's good. It's good. It's good enough. It's not increase the latency, but cut cut a lot of disk space. Uh, review from time to time, cost explorer. If you have access, of course. If CPUs are not uh, fra free cycle, if CPUs have some free cycle, enable compression, and many other good advice. So. Final result of our cutting cost mission. Cutting cost mission. Uh, there is a question for the audience. Uh, have anyone want to guess how many percent we cut our TCO? So total cost ownership. In how 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 many percent we cut we cut we cut our TCO? You can guess. Okay, next, next shot, 60, next shot. Close. For the one who, who will, who will, uh, who will shot, I have one Bitcoin. <laughs> Not? Not less. Okay, who, who said seven, who said seven, seven, 70? Okay, it was, it was 69. So a lot. So it's a Bitcoin for you on the end of present of the end of presentation. So finally, we go with Cassandra 4. We switch because uh, because we we should because the Cassandra 3 is end of, it's end of life. I don't think if I have to tell something else why it's worth to go to the version which is under the support, but yeah, it's important. So thank you for attending my presentation and there is a time for a question. <laughs> no, only, only that one. Of course, we did a lot of we did a lot of different uh, we, do, we did a lot of different uh, scenarios like going to the table, looking on the table stats, uh, going to the, the for example the uh, we don't have data though, but going to our monitoring and figure out which table are is in use, which generate the latency when we can switch to the compression, different compression which table are not in use. There is only also one table which contain, uh, if I could remember, 10 terabytes of data which are not in use so often. So we go to the business to talk with them if we can remove this table. And finally, when we have some calculation of our EBS drive and how much it will save us the money, they said, okay, so, re re so remove that. Which storage? Okay, so the question was on which storage we are. So we are using we are using EBS uh, GP3. Of course, uh, IO2 is it's much faster and have all more and less the performance very 
very similar to local S the local SSD, but it's so expensive. Uh, if I if I will use the IO2, I think that this presentation will be not the cutting cost uh, in name, but will be some I don't know changing the drive, changing the EBS type of drive, because IO2 provision uh, the only not the disk space, but also the IO the number of IOPS and the and the throughput. And if we want to have more IOPS than 100, we have to pay for that. On GP3, by default, we have 3,000 IOPS for free in the free tier. Mm. Okay, so our uh, big so our big IOPS requirement it's uh, if we are a monitor. So during the peak, uh, it was uh, it's it's in the prime time uh, around. Around two, around 2 p.m., where people start to go and maybe and uh, write some write some some charts and stuff like that, it was like two two thousand IOPS per per machine. So we are still in the free tier. In any time when we will observe some big peak of the users, we can go to AWS console and or, or run the Terraform and increase that. Uh, if I could remember, AWS allow us to switch one time per six hour to switch the IOPS in any, in any time. 